Good afternoon, everybody. This is Joe Ambrose at Rural Dental Laboratory uh, speaking. Uh, today's uh, webinar is going to concern how we manage speech on full arch FP3 fixed cases, fixed hybrid cases. Uh, I say good afternoon. You may be on the West Coast, so I'll say good morning if you're on the West Coast. But uh, this topic is something that at least I in my career have not uh, heard discussed at in lectures or whatnot very often. Uh, my career spans uh, a lot of years. I got into the dental laboratory business uh, in 1968, right out of lab school, a one year training course, which really just taught basics. But uh, I learned over the, uh, the span of my career many things, I have experience with uh, all phases of uh, dent you know, dental technology and dentistry. And uh, uh, I'm trying to offer some of that today uh, with this speech uh, issue that I have learned over the years uh, and put together a, a troubleshooting course here for, uh, for that, uh, for your practice. Uh, we get calls quite often about uh, patient speech uh, versus uh, tooth position or how to how to correct it. The doctors sometimes don't know which approach to take to correct some of these speech issues that patients have once they get new uh, restorations. So uh, a little background about me here at the laboratory. I came here in 1986, 1985, the end of 1985. Uh, I had my own lab for quite a few years, and um, uh, one of my first uh, assignments was to develop the implant uh, part of our business, which I have been doing ever since. So in 2004, we got into guided surgery guides, went to the first offering uh, course by Nobel for their Nobel uh, guide software, which has now turned into Nobel clinician. And uh, from that point on, uh, we grew the department and uh, from myself to over 20 people at this point, making guides, doing planning, uh, everything associated with, uh, with guided surgery. So we have a lot of experience with it. And since uh, we have been doing a guided smile, which is our a guided surgical process, a prosthetic process to give people uh, full arch uh, hybrid restorations the day of surgery. Uh, we have learned a lot about how to manage these cases when they come into the laboratory, what questions to ask, uh, what the doctors need to provide us, uh, bites, all those things that make a case successful. And in that context, we have also uh, been engaged in helping doctors manage uh, the issues of speech that we're going to talk about today. So, how come this isn't the down thing's not working out? Hmm. Okay, I'll do it that it, way. It, it's a stall. Hmm. Okay. So, um, this presentation is based on the premise that the changes made to improve or correct speech discrepancies are executed chairside. And so why do I say that? Uh, over the years, we have, before we even got into uh, digital dentures or guided surgery or things of that nature, when we were still doing setups for try-ins in wax, we would go through cases, sometimes one try-in and we would go to finish. Other times, five or six try-ins before it was time to go to finish. And some of it had to do with correcting speech issues. So uh, my uh, philosophy is uh, that if the patient has speech issues, aesthetic issues, anything that uh, is in that realm, that those changes are easy, maybe not easily corrected chairside, but finally corrected at chairside, meaning that uh, you will see immediate results and solutions by trying to make these changes that we're gonna discuss right at the chair with the patient speaking and going through all these sounds that you need to, need to correct. Uh, and by doing that, you'll save multiple, and I put excruciating appointments, and I'm sure some of you have been through these cases where it gets to be excruciating. Uh, you'll save time and money uh, by trying to correct these things right there when you have the patient with you. 
So uh, speech complications are, 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 are common when people get uh, new uh, teeth, especially when it has to do with anterior teeth. Um, you know, the, the size of the prosthetic, and we're talking about the hybrids now that we're making, the bulk of the prosthetic, uh, strains phonetics, uh, and the doctors have to work hard to find the best compromise uh, for uh, this prosthetic to, to be in, in terms of size and tooth position so that the patient can speak properly. And, and feel good about themselves when they speak because sometimes to us, when we hear people speak, it doesn't sound awful, but to them, they sound like they don't know how to talk. So, you know, they wanna feel comfort, com confident and, uh, you know, sometimes their jobs require that they uh, speak well and have good diction. And uh, so we have to solve these problems for them, okay? Uh, so, uh, you know, all the clinical issues, uh, even sometimes emotional issues that people kind of feel when they're going through this process should be, you should try to be solved before going to the final process, uh, the final appliance. And that doesn't mean they all have to be solved that day, but as they're wearing their provisional work on it, make these changes slowly but surely until you're happy, the patient's happy, they can speak well, look nice, and the bite is, is where you want it to be. So uh, basically, this uh, all comes down to lips and tongues and tooth position. And both the lips and the tongues need room to move. Uh, otherwise, they can't do the function that is required by our muscles to pronounce words properly. So uh, lips, need, uh, lips and teeth, uh, tongues need room to move. You can see right at the top, the picture has all the different sounds that we make in the process of speaking that we don't realize or think about, uh, you know, in normal situations. But uh, in a case where we, the patient has had a lot of bone reduction, they have a prosthesis that the teeth might be in a little bit of a different place, the arch form is different, they get tongue tied. And sometimes, you know, they don't know they're not confident. They all of a sudden hate the process they're going through, and, and we have to solve it for them. Uh, they, they end up with stuttering or slurred speech, and, uh, and they're very confused by it. So uh, patients complain of slurring, hissing, lisping, spitting, problems with the sounds TH, F, and S. S happens to be the one that most people have trouble with that I've encountered. Uh, but usually, probably in the vast majority of cases, people don't have too much of a problem with their speech. And after a little bit of time, uh, you know, they, they, they adjust to it, their speech comes back to them, and they're okay. But in, in severe cases or uh, cases where patients, again, have, uh, you know, very uh, visible jobs, uh, any little deviation from uh, normal is something they, they won't tolerate. So one thing I've seen over the years, not only with, uh, with the guided surgery or uh, hybrid type cases where, that we're extracting all the teeth and giving people teeth the same day, is that during surgery, for the most part, pe people are in the supine position. And uh, just simple gravity, you know, the jaw can change positions. It tends to retrude as they're laying there and uh, you know, the jaw has a hard time finding its way back to their normal centric when it comes time to check the bite. And, uh, you know, especially as they become lucid, you know, without us trying to position that for them or the doctor trying to position their bite for them, as they wake up, they, there's, there's something new in their mouth that doesn't feel good to their tongue. They try to bite the back teeth hit a lot of times, uh, or you're, they're in a crossbite, uh, and uh, something's not right. So uh, I have found that during the bite check process, it's good to have the patient sitting up where the jaw can uh, relax into the normal position that it should be in uh, or that they function with uh, during their life and try to correct, you know, get the bite into the correct position in that uh, uh, sitting position. Uh, so the complications that can arise that can cause problems are arch width changes, uh, causing retricted uh, tongue space, and a lot of it can be due to the bulk of the provisional. 
but the bulk of the provisional has everything to do with where the teeth are placed. So once we put these in the patient's mouth, you know, the day of surgery, they can't talk well and, and, and you know, they're swollen. Uh, they've just had a, a lot of surgery done and they're beat up and tired. So uh, most uh, doctors will say, uh, you know, we'll, if you have speech issues after a couple of weeks, then let it last, you know, t use it that long. And we'll start attacking these problems because sometimes within those two weeks, everything works itself out. So uh, if it doesn't though, uh, where can we make adjustments? And that's what this uh, uh, webinar is about. How do we adjust these and how can we correct these speech problems? Uh, and quite often, uh, if, if some of these problems are, are addressed at the day of surgery with the patient laying down, uh, I, I've seen cases where the vertical dimension has been changed uh, and the bite class has been changed. Uh, and sometimes because one, maybe the bite wasn't correct in the first place when we made the case, and two, because of the position the patient was in and in his surgery day and they're, you know, they've been anesthetized and, and, their, and their joint has uh, been beat up during the surgery. So uh they some people have a hard time finding their bite right away so where can adjustments be made and all of these problems that we're going to talk about today uh, have a way to attack have there is a way that we can solve these for the most part is it always going to be perfect not always and there's reasons for that but can we get close i think we can and can we solve most of them i think we can So there are different sound groups, and there's five. Uh, tongue to the hard palate, which is the DNT sound. Tongue to the teeth, which is the L and the TH sound. Teeth to teeth, which is the S, SH, and the Z sound. Uh, teeth to lips, which is the F and V, and lip to lip, which is BMP sounds. So once we group this, into this, uh, into this series of uh, sounds, uh, it's easier to try start to isolate what we need to work on. And then we can focus on the changes that we need to make. So the first one is the tongue to hard palate, which is D and T. And typically the tip of your tongue when we say these things is somewhere in the area of the incisive papilla to make these sounds. And uh, there's ways that this can be corrected, some surgically, and, and I put these three slides in to show you uh, why sometimes this DNT sound be can become a problem. Uh, most uh, placing doctors that I work with like to have the implant placed lingual lingually in the socket, and that's okay. Uh, sometimes, though, we'll find that uh, the implant is placed lingually in the socket and, and actually the trajectory is lingual to the, uh, lingual to the, uh, very much lingual to the incisal edge of the teeth to the point where if when we make a prosthesis, as you see in the right picture, that the prosthesis actually covers the incisive papilla. Now I know that it's not always possible uh, to uh, perfectly place an implant so that some of the incisive papilla uh, isn't covered, but I think the goal would be to try to get to a point where once the final prosthetic is made, that we can at least have that area thin enough so that uh, making the DNT sounds isn't quite as much of a problem that it, as it would be if we were not able to relieve uh, material in that area and have a, have a substance of uh, acrylic or, or zirconia there covering the insides of the papilla. Uh, so there are ways that we can uh, correct that, though, even if uh, that is, if an implant is placed in that lingual area where the appliance would cover the incisive of papilla, and one of them is, first of all, just to grind the material away, and, and we want to try to do this in the provisional so that we can duplicate it in the final, grind material away uh, enough so that that speech with the DNT sounds improves. And uh, or along with changing abutment heads, if it's possible, 
uh, if it was a zero degree abutment and the placement of the implant was uh, in the picture like you see uh, in the middle picture, um, uh, you, we might want to get that implant uh, trajectory or the, the screw trajectory aimed more towards the lingual of the incisal edge. And using a, an, a, an angulated abutment facing forward can do that for us. So once that happens, the goal of being able to thin the appliance out and improve speech in that area is more possible. And, and so we can end up with more success in correcting the DNT sounds by doing that. Um, one thing I forgot to mention when I started was if you have questions, uh, we you know, we'll entertain questions at the end of this process. You can put them into the chat box as you, as you uh, have questions and uh, we will address them at the end uh, of the program uh, as many as uh, we can. So uh, moving forward, uh, the incisive papilla area is, is an important uh, uh, group of sounds that we want to try to uh, have the ability to uh, not cover with thick, thick restorative material. And, and this is an example. If you look at the picture on the left, the little yellow uh, post that you see within the orange circle is the trajectory of the implant. And you can see how far lingual that is. And we have had to deal with these problems. Um, sometimes uh, uh, more so with freehand implant placements than with uh, uh, implants placed with a guide. Uh, because we, with the guide, when we plan cases, we try to plan our trajectories uh, like you see uh, pictured on the right side picture with the uh, implant trajectory closer to the inside, closer to the lingual of the anterior teeth. And you know, ideally, we want that access hole to be three millimeters, uh, approximately three millimeters from the incisal edge. If we were to measure lingually from the incisal edge, three millimeters uh, lingual to the incisal edge, and that's where the screw access hole would be. So with that measurement, we are able to control the size of the framework or the, uh, the appliance on the lingual side in the anterior. The picture on the left shows how far away we are uh, with the placement, the trajectory of the implant. So what that means is, where you see that yellow post or yellow uh, uh, indicator, our appliance has to be three millimeters lingual to that for strength. So on the left picture, if we go three millimeters lingual to that position with our appliance, it's gonna cover most of the uh, incisive of the papilla. And on the right side picture, if we go three millimeters, it's gonna leave some of that incisive of papilla uh, exposed so, uh, you know, thereby creating the ability for the patient to speak the, uh, the D uh, and T sounds. And this is, uh, this is what we would do in, in the planning uh, area when we do this. Uh, this is from a live case that we've done. Um, the picture on the left uh, gives us the least ability to correct the DNT sound. The picture on the right gives us the best ability to correct the DNT sounds. The only way to fix the position on the left to bring the screw access hole more to the facial is to get an angulated abutment and, and aim it forward so that the screw access hole exits in the cingulum area of the tooth like you see in the right picture. We can't do any more than that. I know that when we do these cases, there are gonna be compromises, but the picture on the right gives us the best chance for the least amount of compromise. Okay. So the solutions to DNT, apart from changing abutment heads, are if the patient in their provisional has this issue, uh, first of all, you know, as, as much as possible, the placing doctor, the surgeon, uh, should be cognizant of this issue and how it can be avoided by placing the implant in a position where this sound can be executed properly once the prosthesis is made. Uh, mechanical solutions to it are, as you see in the bottom picture, uh, we can take a burr 
and we can take the appliance and we can thin it out and shape it uh, little by little until we see the patient's speech improve to the point where we we have grounded enough that uh, that the sound improves. If we can grind it enough to correct the entire uh, DNT sound, that's good. But we have to stop grinding when uh, we start to compromise the strength of the appliance. And in the provisional, uh, that's going to be a little thicker than in the final. So when we reach the final, we can actually, most of the time, make the final uh, appliance a little thinner in that area to help us. So uh, grinding just the, the lingual uh, behind the anterior teeth in the provisional to correct this is a simple way to uh, start to attack this problem. The next uh, solution is uh, try to make the uh, footprint of the appliance, as you see in the top picture, the part that is over the ridge, as narrow as possible. Uh, keeping in mind that we have to have three millimeters lingual to each one of those uh, holes where the cylinder of the appliance is uh, just for strength. But by keeping the footprint smaller, we expose more of the palate and uh, the tongue has, you know, more ability to find the correct areas that needs to touch to say sounds. So we'll go to the next uh, group in which is the L sound, and that is uh, tongue to teeth. So when people say L, usually the tip of the tongue is at the lower end of the cingulum area on the upper teeth. And, uh, you know, the L sound is formed, the lingual tip of the tongue contacts the lingual, the maxillary anterior teeth. Anterior teeth that are placed too far forward or too far lingually can affect this sound. So how do we correct it? Uh, acrylic, as you see uh, in, in the bottom picture, can be at, or on the top picture, can be added to the facials of the teeth or the linguals of the teeth, like you see on the bottom picture, uh, to correct the sound. And that all depends upon what position the teeth are in initially. If the, if the, if the patient needs to have uh, the teeth brought lingually or a little more bulk added so that their tongue can find the L sound, that's what we can do. And then shape, you know, after we add, we do some shaping to, to, uh, to uh, make it make the sound even better. Or we can add uh, acrylic to the facials of the teeth if the incisal edge position needs to be more forward. Uh, we can also add acrylic to the lingual of the teeth and bring the incisal edge lingually if we need to, as, as you see in the bottom picture, which I talked about. Um, uh, and that can be corrected. And I, you know, work with doctors chairside with this, and we go through these exercises, and right in front of your eyes, you can see this patient start to talk better. Uh, start to make their sounds better. Uh, and one thing that I have to mention also with this is quite often vertical dimension uh, plays a part in this too. So along with the uh, uh, sounds that we're going to try to correct here, <clears throat> uh, vertical dimension, if it's not in its correct position, can, <clears throat> can cause speech problems simply because the tongue doesn't have enough room to, to move, as we talked about earlier in the um, discussion. Uh, if you suspect that the teeth are too far to the facial, as I said, add compositor acrylic to the lingual of the teeth and just slowly develop this uh, L sound with the patient. The TH sound, uh, is, is all these sounds we do every day unconsciously, uh, and that's uh, tongue to teeth again. The TH sound is formed when the tip of the tongue passes through the anterior teeth, having light contact with the maxillary teeth. And this uh, is something that pertains to, to vertical dimension also and freeway space. And vertical dimension and freeway space are intertwined to a point. Um, and what happens if there is not enough freeway space is the TH sound is restricted because the tongue doesn't have room to move. And that means that the anterior teeth are too high or too low or the VDO uh, you know, is open too much and we need to change that. So one of those three things are 
usually the culprit. Uh, there should be a minimum of two to three millimeters of the maximum intercuspation, uh, uh, forced uh, freeway space uh, with these patients at rest. And if you don't have that, and there are speech problems, then um, you know that that's something that needs to be looked at and corrected uh, simply by grinding or adding. If uh, you suspect that the teeth are set too low, restrict, restricting freeway space, too much vertical dimension, just reduce the, uh, the plane, whether it's the upper or lower, and you'll have to check to, to see which one is the prudent one to, uh, to fix. Or do you need to reduce anterior teeth, uh, lower or upper? Any of those things are possible uh, to, to improve the TH sound. And 33 is a good uh, exercise for the patient to uh, say until we get this uh, problem solved. If the teeth are set too high with not enough anterior tooth display, then you can add, just add composite to the length and have the patient say 33, 33, 33. Uh, you might have to do this a few times with your composite until the patient can say that sound properly. And by adding to that length, there might have to be other adjustments made to the opposing, uh, whether it be uh, moving lower anterior teeth or uh, vertical dimension, uh, any of those things are possible. So with every action, when you're trying to solve these sound problems, there's a reaction. So you fix one thing, it may affect another, and all those things need to be taken into consideration as you go through this uh, uh, process of correcting speech. Okay, a teeth to teeth, S and Z. And as I mentioned earlier, the S sound is the one that I find the most common problem. And there are a couple fixes for that. So I'm sure many of you uh, have had the same issue with the S sound. It's, it's probably, again, uh, the hardest one, well, maybe not the hardest one to solve, but the most prevalent one. Uh, and, and this is because a hybrid of, uh, prosthesis affects so many aspects of forming this S sound. Airflow under the, the appliance, you know, it has to be controlled. So once surgery is done, usually we have some ridge contact uh, with the appliance to the tissue. And, uh, but as the patient heals, that space begins to open. And the S sound uh, is something that they find is more difficult to uh, pronounce. So that means that initially, if the S sound was good, and as time goes by, the S sound becomes something they struggle with, usually it means that there's the space between the tissue and the intaglio surface of the uh, hybrid uh, is open too much and that needs to be filled. They'll complain of, of saliva going through there or air uh, and also you know the sound of the S and the Z isn't something that they can master. So it's just by simply filling that gap underneath as you see in the top in the picture on the right at the border, uh, that can go a long way to solve these problems. If, uh, if enough if the patient has had this long enough and you feel comfortable removing the appliance, you can actually do a reline uh, on the intaglio surface and correct it that way. And uh, that's, you know, a pretty simple way to do it. And it's, uh, however you do your relines, you simply take the appliance off, uh, put some material in place, reseat it, or you can take an impression uh, on, on the intaglio surface, take it out, make a model, and do your reline that way, and that will give you a perfect fit to the tissue and, and usually solve the problem of uh, the S, S, real sharp S sound or, or the whistling sound that people get. Whistling is not uncommon with provisional since air passes under the bridge uh, during speech, and then most of the time it's on the upper where that problem exists. So how do we correct it other than uh, filling the gap uh, on the tissue is uh, if, if there is too much contact, uh, a lisp can occur. 
So uh, too much contact with the incisal edges. So uh, in other words, a patient bites down and uh, they, they actually bite, or they, they go to say S or Z and their anterior teeth actually indent themselves into the lower lip. So you might have to adjust the uh, incisal edge of the teeth. Uh, if the maxillary anteriors, if the, if, the, if the anterior is in the correct aesthetic position, then uh, sometimes shortening the mandibular teeth can help or some sort of vertical dimension change. If the maxillary teeth are too long, shorten them up a little bit. Now, if uh, the, the maxillary teeth are good and the lower teeth are too short, they, those can also be lengthened with composite right there, chair side and have the patient just repeat 66 until uh, the sound is uh, correct or as close as you can get it to being correct. So, you know, also, um, if the opposing arch, the lower, is a natural, uh, our natural teeth, and uh, to, you know, as the teeth, if there's no contact initially with the lower teeth, if they super are up and the lisp returns, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, you might have to make sure that uh, there's, there's contact between the upper and lower incisal edges. So that's just another test you can make to try to correct the S or the Z sound. Teeth to teeth is the SH sound. Okay. And this is the last factor in the group. Uh, the culprit here is posterior arch width. And that's because the tongue doesn't have enough room in the posterior to say that sound correctly. Uh, maybe it has too much room, but that's, that's all arch form. And that's something that, you know, initially when we make the appliance, we have to make a decision on. And quite often right now, especially with uh, the, the ability to use uh, a smile design technology to have, let a patient see what they're going to look like. Sometimes we widen the arch to fill the buccal corridors. And sometimes when we do that, the speech is affected. So, you know, that's something to look at initially when we first put these in the patient's mouth. Uh, you may need to, uh, you know, if the, t if the arch is too wide, you, you might need to add to the linguals of the teeth to get the arch width correct, thereby you know, if it's, if it's that much, reducing the buccal surfaces if you have to. Uh, so, you know, we want to make sure of the arch form in that instant, instance. But if you see the bottom right picture, these are the areas that you can grind to help the SH sound uh, get corrected. And even if you have to grind into the teeth themselves on the lingual surface, it's okay. It's a provisional. We need to know that information when we go to the, uh, the final so that we can get the lingual surface of the teeth in the right spot uh, so that this problem doesn't reoccur when we make the final prosthesis. And usually slurring is what happens when people have this problem. Sometimes to correct it, uh, creating a slight uh, crossbite to make room, uh, a slight overjet on the teeth to make room. Uh, and in some cases, the patient will just have to adapt. So. Um, but, you know, there is a way to try to improve it simply by making space for the lower tongue on the lingual of the appliance itself. F and V sounds, which is another common, that's probably the second most uh, common problem that I've run into with doctors. So the F and V sounds are made with the incisal edges of the upper teeth slightly contacting the wet dry line of the lower uh, vermilion border. A maxillary seat that are set too high or low will impact this sound. Uh, reducing the length of the teeth with a burr or by adding composite to the teeth can correct the F and the V sounds. Uh, 55 is, is the phrase that you want people to uh, use uh, to help you uh, correct this problem. And what I have noticed also, if patients have a problem with the F and the V sounds, uh, quite often uh, you'll see patients' lower lip reaching up to touch the incisal edges 
of the upper teeth. And that's, that's, there's two things that could be the problem. Too much vertical dimension, or you need to add length to uh, the incisal edges of the upper teeth. And what I have found with all this is that once uh, we correct the sound problems with these patients, the vertical dimension, length of teeth, uh, arch form, they correct themselves because the muscles, you know, pretty much uh, are used to what the patient spoke like before they had this surgery. And if we can get them back to that position, they will speak better. So um, again, the lower lip reaching up to find the incisal ledge is an indication of that the, the, the incisal ledges might need to be longer or the vertical dimension closed. BMP sounds, which is lips to lips when we say these sounds, um, can be uh, too much vertical dimension, meaning that uh, this patient needs to have their vertical dimension closed down. Uh, their patients will feel like they can't contact their lips properly. They struggle uh, to, to do that uh, little uh, lip contact. Their faces appear long and they'll struggle saying these letters because they, they're struggling to bring their teeth together. And quite often too, when you have this, you might hear some clacking between upper and lower teeth because there isn't enough freeway space. And as they speak, um, you know, their teeth touch and, and you hear these sounds. And that's especially important when we're doing zirconia restorations against natural teeth or zirconia against zirconia, because that's one thing that patients will complain about uh, if, 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 they, if they function and they hear their teeth clacking. And for the most part, at that point, uh, there's only two things you can do. You can try to adjust the zirconia, which is not really uh, something that uh, if you, you know we want to do too much of, simply because of the chemistry of the zirconia, or we remake one of the arches at a at a lesser vertical dimension. So uh, you know, if we're not talking about zirconia, you can grind the teeth on either arch. Uh, to reposition uh, until the correct vertical dimension is found. Now, as I mentioned before, though, all of this should be done in the provisional appliances so that if you do decide to go to zirconia, that problem <clears throat> is solved and you should not have the clacking uh, or grinding issue to get BDO correct. Uh, alternatives to fixed hybrids. If if, you know, if the patient, uh, you know, is concerned about speech complications right from the get-go, or they don't want a lot of bone to be reduced simply because it's their mouth and, you know, they, they just don't want to go through that, we can always go to an FP1 zirconia restoration, porcelain fused to metal, which we're doing fewer and fewer of, uh, which requires very little or sometimes no bone reduction. And uh, the FP3, because the nature of it, uh, you know, if we're replacing teeth that have been immediately extracted, we can get these teeth pretty much back into the same spot they were before, uh, can minimize speech issues. So uh, that's the end of this program. I have a couple more slides to go over. But really, the tough choices, the biggest decisions you have to make are going to be when both uh, arches are treated with hybrids because you have to manage both arches at the same time. Uh, if the patient has remaining natural teeth, that arch form can be followed and usually results in not as many problems with speech other than maybe anterior tooth position or, you know, the posterior overjet that the uh, upper posteriors have over the lower posteriors. Uh, if the patient's fully edentulous and, and don't have dentures, uh, they come to you like that, which sometimes happens. The only thing we can do are make uh, or follow anatomical landmarks. And when make, we make bite rims, make sure that you try to get the plane of occlusion correct, the anterior contour of the bite rim co uh, correct, high lip line, uh, and you know, incisal edge position correct. So we can follow that and give us the best chance of Get, getting the patient into a provisional that, you know, they're, they're going to be able to use. But when we're doing these uh, full arch cases, we should be doing uh, teeth try-ins 
uh, and all of that, uh, you know, if they're fully edentulous, to make sure that uh, all those things are corrected before we go to finish. So if, if for some reason we get the arch form wrong, uh, you know, we're, we're going to need to do a new setup or try in with the correct arch form. If you widen the arches too far, uh, lots of times patients will bite their cheeks. It has nothing to do with speech, but it, you know, it's painful and uh, needs fixed. So the time you spend working on out phonetic details in the try-in will save you uh, time, frustration, and money uh, in the long run. So I'd like to thank you for your participation. This wasn't a long program, but I hope you find it helpful in diagnosing some of these problems and it gives you a way to attack them and solve them uh, when, the, you know, when the need arises. We can take questions now, no problem. Okay, here's one here. I, do, does Roe have a phonetics worksheet that can be used during the interim and try in phase to walk through with patients? It's gonna be very easy to make a worksheet and we can make a real quick checklist off of this. And we will do that and we'll post it on the website. Uh, do you find that S and Z sounds are also dependent on whether the patient is class one, class three? I have a class two patient that uses that use tongue near the incisive of the career of the sound. Uh, you know, that's a good question. Bite class can have an effect on uh, sounds, especially I would think class threes. Um, usually, even I, I can't answer that exactly. Um, class one and class two, Class one obviously is the easiest one to correct. Class two, uh, you know, sometimes the F and the V sounds uh, uh, have an issue simply because the, you know, uh, the teeth are uh, maybe not in the same position they were before the, before the surgery started. My experience with class two is if a, if a patient presents with a class two, uh, try to keep the class two you know, pretty close to where it was originally, because once you start bringing the patient's teeth out, the lower lip gets affected, uh, and there's some issues uh, with phonetics and even function at that point, and you'll see a bulge in the patient's lip. So uh, just, just from experience, if a patient is a skeletal class two, it's probably not good to try to really deviate from that too much with just prosthetics. Uh, with F and V sounds, how do you decide when to add and when to subtract from upper and lower? Okay, if with the prosthesis uh, that the patient's wearing, and we haven't done any adjustments yet, if they have a problem with F and V, first of all, uh, watch their lower lip. If when they say F and V, you see the lower lip, and the patient tries to raise the lower lip to find contact, with the incisal edge, that's a good indicator that the teeth need lengthened. Um, if you know they don't do that, uh, and you look at the patient, it all becomes a matter of acceptable tooth display. So if they can't say F and V uh, <clears throat> properly, uh, you know, and they don't raise their lower lip, it could be that the teeth need shortened a, a little bit. So that's something that you have to play with. Uh, chair side uh, with your uh, light cured, uh, uh, you know, uh, a flowable composite to try to correct that. So it can be either lengthening or shortening, but I think that the lower lip can be a dead giveaway for that. Uh, usually, if the, if the teeth are in the correct aesthetic position, and that could be anywhere from <clears throat> one to two millimeters difference from one patient to the next, or how you treat the sound, uh, you know, it's something that you just have to do by trial and error. And that's why I said early in the program that these speech corrections can need to be done chair side. We can do them here at the lab and we can send cases back and forth three, four, five times to try to correct it. But, you know, taking the time chair side for that, that issue is it will save you a lot of agony and, and end up getting the case done quicker and more successfully. So, uh, okay. Uh, is it useful to, Evaluate phonetics before extractions and document. Absolutely. That is something that <clears throat> if I were uh, to give you a good suggestion, I would actually make a recording of it. 
I would have your patient in there. I would take your phone or your camera, whatever you need to use, and record them speaking. Get very, you know, close up so you don't have, so you have their whole face in the picture and have them say these sounds with the, with the sound volume on so that you have a, a, a real, uh, you have evidence of how they speak so that you can compare that speech to uh, what is reproduced when they get provisionals. It will also show you, you know, tooth length, tooth display, some of those things, you know, you kind of forget. And just by a photograph, you can't tell how it's going to affect speech. So if you, re if you look at the patient face forward and, and just videotape them talking, that is an excellent thing to do because those sounds need to be reproduced.